Hello everyone. Welcome to the lecture on marginals and human rights. This lecture is part of a paper on media and margins. In this lecture, we will learn about the key concepts of marginals and human rights. We will also deal with the different facets of human right, their origin and their present day understanding. We will also understand how the everyday issues of human rights are being addressed by the state. Marginal and human rights. Let us begin with deconstructing the basic concept of marginal and human rights. Who are the marginal? The dictionary would define the marginal as the minority. As people who do not have a voice or view of their own. Can we call the marginal the subalterns? Who for long could not raise their voice and could not make it to the chronicles of history? Now, if one has to define the word marginal, it is enormous and it includes within it an array of categories like women, people who are differently able, lower caste, tribes, and other social and political minorities. Thus, we can also use the term subaltern for the marginals. While both the term subaltern and marginal refer to the group of people who are outside the hegemonic power structures and could not voice their opinion, the terms have different connotations. Though they are not exactly synonymous, for the understanding of this lecture, we will be using the terms as synonymous. Secondly, what are human rights? Simply put, human rights refer to the elementary fundamental rights of the individuals which shield them legally and politically by the virtue of being born as a human. The trajectory of human rights dates antiquity. The National Human Rights Commission of India defines human rights as the rights relating to the life, liberty, equality and dignity of the individual guaranteed by the constitution or embodied in the international covenants and enforceable by courts in India. In most civilizations across the world, value for life and right over death were important. These were inherent in the traditional social order. Basic human rights were ascertained by giving individuals freedom and respect. But the present day understanding of human right is a product of a different discourse. French Revolution and Renaissance can be considered as the torch barrier of the contemporary discourse globally. The ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity were products of the modern world. Fight for democratic rights mark its way for the suffragette movement which was followed by two world wars which reinterpreted history and followed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. On 10 December 1948, the United Nations General Assembly declared the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Paris, French. This was the beginning of modern day human rights. You must now be wondering what is the correlation between human rights and the marginals? While human rights are the fundamental to all, it turned out to be more essential for those who could not make themselves visible and manage space for themselves in the canons of history. We can cite the instances of development displacement and its impact on human rights. 
the massive hydroelectric power projects in the northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh and its massive impact on the people living in the downstream areas is nothing but an example of gross human rights violation. In the pretext of development, there is large-scale displacement and migration of people. We can also cite example of POSCO. We all are aware of the effects of POSCO in the tribal pockets of Orissa. Mostly, such move affect the marginals and more so the women. We can also cite example of ASPA in Manipur and its, its impact on women. Women as such are the worst victims. They are innumerable accounts of women fighting against the atrocities of such a draconian act. Another area where we can see gross violation of human rights is the issue of dis disability in India. The debate on disability bill and its consequences on the state policies is a clear indication of how the ones at the margins are often been ignored in the process of inclusive development. This ability friendly public convenience, toilets and the presence of ramps in public spaces is a rare sight in India. In a recent piece in the Economy and Political Weekly, the National Platform for the Rights of the Disabled brings up the issue of G. Sai Baba and the absence of disabled friendly facilities at Nagpur Central Jail. However, there has been a conscious effort to include them in the process of good governance. At this juncture, it becomes extremely important to have the human right which act as a cover. In such a context, what role do human rights play? Here, human rights act as an external shield and protect and assert a kind of coercion on behalf of individuals and groups who cannot raise their voice against any such act. But how do we determine that the victims of human rights identify and act as a violation of the human rights? In most cases, the civil society organization take the initiative, pledge a process for human development. Hence, we can summarize that human rights are essential for all, but the marginal subalterns are the ones who need them the most. As they have been out of the hegemonic quarters of power, they have had the difficulty in asserting their rights. What is more difficult is the fact that in most cases, the individuals are often caught and aware that there has been a case of human rights violation, human rights and Indian history. Human rights have been a part of Indian history. Indian context, Artha Sastra and Drama Sastras did not only act as a mere guide book of conduct, but also acted as essential text which helped to regulate the lives of every citizen. The king, his citizen, both men and women, were to abide by the principles of human rights, which were independent from executive and were under the judiciary. Such a distinction made the Indian system unique. The state was not sacerdotal nor even paternalistic. Even the king was subject to the law. As any other citizen and the divine right of the kings known to Western political science was unknown to India. On the whole, the aim of the ancient Indian state may be said to have been less to introduce and improve social order than to act in conformity with the established moral. In Arthur Sastra, Kautilya not only emphasized on the civil and legal rights of the citizen as formulated by Manu, Manu, but he also ensured that the king should take care of the orphan, the aged, 
the infirm and the hapless, mother and the children and father provide them with maintenance. Thus, in ancient India, one can see that human rights were essentially a part of the state and law. In post-Vedic age, genesis of Buddhism and Jainism were a clear indication of the deterioration of the moral order. This was followed by Ashoka, who protected and secure rights for all human beings and finally established a welfare state. Islamic era in India also saw the expansion of intolerance and separate laws for both Hindus and Muslims. The ancient Indian philosophies of tolerance were gradually withering away. With the Mughal rule of Akbar, India showed the birth of a new philosophy of tolerance, universal reconciliation, reconciliation and tolerance. This philosophy of Akbar was not only accepted by the Indians but was also appreciated worldwide. The colonial regime was known for its atrocities against the Indians. Indians were debarred from entering the public spaces on various grounds. They were denied of the civil, economical, legal and political rights as citizens of the nation. This was the era when leaders like Mahatma Gandhi called for participation of people and began non-violent struggles against the British Raj. It was a result of the honest efforts of the leaders and the masses that the colonial regime passed many resolutions like the India Charter Act 1830 and the Government of Indian Act 1833. However, the concrete demand for human rights came with India's independence movement. The Nehru Committee was constituted to draft the bill adapting Declaration of Rights under the chairmanship of Motilal Nehru. However, in 1927, Simon Commission completely rejected the draft which was put forth by Motilal Nehru. This was the declaration of Purna Swaraj by the Congress Working Committee in 1930. In 1931, Karachi session of the Indian National Congress adopted a detailed program of fundamental rights. With the adoption of Indian Constitution in 1950, Indian citizens were granted the fundamental rights as the preamble of the Indian Constitution declared India to be a sovereign, socialist and democratic republic. The preamble ensures equality for all irrespective of race, ethnicity and gender. Thus, even though human rights were a must in the very foundation of Indian civilization, it took a long time to enter the legal framework. State and human rights. By now you must be clear that the state plays a crucial role in upholding the human right. The directive principles and the fundamental rights guarantee India's citizen the elementary rights of citizen. But is it enough? Here we can pose another question. Does the state support human rights? Yes, on principle, the state acts as custodian of the human rights. On 28 September 1993, the Protection of Human Rights Act was introduced for the protection of all citizens across India. The National Human Rights Commission, which was subsequently established under the edges of the Act, was an indication of the state concern for human rights. The Commission was initiated to help people to have 
a legitimate say in the state policies vis-a-vis -vis human rights. The main objective of the NHRC is to have an inclusive goal and agenda. It focuses on the issue of good governance, which include concern over health, civil and political rights of the citizen and many more. The NHRC in terms of its organizational structure is inclusive apart from the chairperson and other members. The organizational pyramid includes the chairperson of National Commission for Minorities, the National Commission for Schedule Caste, Schedule Tribes and the National Commission for Women. Thus, they stay through its different mechanisms as this try to keep a vigil on the protection of fundamental human rights. The NHRC also has its branches across states in India followed by human rights courts. While the organization and functioning of the NHRC appear inclusive, does it mean that human rights are inclusive? You must be wondering if the state has such an organized mechanism of regulating human rights, then where lies the problem? There should not be any question on the functioning of the human rights. But reality is somewhat different. The issue of human rights, even though seems all-encompassing, it's not inclusive. Here we can bring up instances of human rights and development. For example, in parts of Kashmir Valley, the citizens are denied access to internet in the pretext of national security. In certain senses, having access to internet can be considered as an indicator of development and freedom. On the contrary, no access to internet can be considered as bad indicators of development and freedom. In the same country, we can see few states having access to latest internet services and normalcy, but on the other hand, there are states for whom the use of the same becomes a matter of privilege. In the northeastern state of Assam, the counter-insurgency operations of the Indian Army in early 1990s also named Operation Bachran against the United Liberation Firm of Assam had witnessed gross violation of human rights. During the operation, the Guwahati High Court was flooded with Hobbes Corpus petitions. The Indian Army, on the protest of suspicion, would pick up youths from the holes. These youths who were picked once would never return. There were 99 cases of Hobbes Corpus in the Guwahati High Court as per the courts. The local dailies were flooded with reports of missing youths. The list of atrocities did not end with missing youths as it further included cases of shooting, disappearance and Red. A prominent English daily of Assam, Sentinel, reported on December 27, 1990, army terrorized villages, where the villagers had complained of the army taking money, oranges, and also burning examination and scripts in a village under the Mukham police station of Tinchukia district. Another headline, Versity student tortured was published in another Delhi, the Northeast Times, March 11, 1991. The Delhi reported on the torture of the student, which included throwing cold water on him and giving him electric shocks. Such even took place when the state was under the president's rule for the fourth time in history. The consequences of Operation Bertrand were mixed. There were joint coordination meetings between the district administration and the Indian Army. In one such meeting held at Sipsagar district of Assam, the army went up to the extent of calling 
the deputy commissioner and superintendent of police as UNFA supporters. Thus, it turns out to be very difficult to draw the line between human rights violation and the state vigil. The very nature of human rights is fragile. The process of inclusion of few and exclusion of the race in the process poses question on infringement of human rights. If one is to ask what do we limit such infringement? It becomes difficult to comprehend its outer limits and answer. Human rights today. It becomes extremely interesting to take cognizance of the challenges that human rights face today. 21st century has witnessed many violations of human rights globally. India too is not an exception to the same. Amartya Sen in Human Rights and Human Development Report 2000 tries to delineate the relationship between human rights and human development. He further articulates that world nature and compatibility of the two seems obvious. The human rights literature covers within its range the political and civil liberties, whereas the human development indicators are focused around socio-economic concerns. Thus, one may conceptualize human development without giving a large picture of civil and political rights that have been the significant futures of the international human rights movement. Amita Bhaviska, in her work in the belly of the river, brings in the crisis of development and states idea of development for the people at the margins. She brings in the crisis of the Narmada, Bachao Andalan, and criticizes state's agenda of industrialization based destructive development. For our understanding, we can divide the instances of human rights violation into different categories. Development and human rights violation, child rights violation, atrocities on Dalits, members of minority community, disabled, caste-based violation, communal and ethnic violation, abuses by armed forces and extrajudicial killings, custodial rape, or are to name a few. Although the Indian constitution approves and supports human rights in the court of law, we need to understand the influence of human rights on the merge. In a recent article, Manorajan Mohanty writes, the Indian state's strategy to combat nationalism has wreaked havoc on the Adivasi and tribal communities. A heavily militarized area of operation is certainly not the answer for peace and security. It might make those in power feel less insecure, but eventually such a strategy will have disastrous effects when those who have been alienated, exploited and displaced take up arms against the state. The right strategy for developing, developing adversities communities is through the de-escalation of military operation and providing them with autonomy and institutional support. In the state of Manipur, Indian Army Rep Us became a popular slogan in 2004 when Emas, the Manipuri mothers, came out to protest at Kangla Fort against the rap of a young girl, Tanjam Monorama, by the Assam Rifles. Her body was found with multiple bullets on her genitals. This incident led to massive protest across the state. The incident caught much attention of nation as it involved, mostly women from all walks of life. Thus, what are the human rights and what promises 
do this right holds becomes indefinite. The state often tries to bring up a discourse of human right, which many a times is not supported by the individuals at stake. Such discourses affect the ones at the margins the most, whether it is the case of Tanjam Manaroma in Manipur, tribes of Jharkhand, or the families of the victims of Operation Batran in Assam, they under this human rights violation. While we cannot deny the role of state in initiating the framework for human rights and engaging in a dialogue, there is yet a long way to incorporate human rights in every sense of the term. Conclusion In this model, we have been introduced to the fundamentals of human rights, the need for human rights, and the role of various agencies in ascertaining such rights to individuals. History of Indian civilization suggests that human rights, or rather the right to life, has been cardinal to the Indian philosophy. The ancient Indian state also took care of the people who were at the margin. But often in understanding the human right, the state misses the margin and infringes on individual rights. Hence, the interpretation of human rights vary. For a few, aspa may be a violation of human rights, but at the same time, one may interpret it as essential for maintaining human peace and tranquility. We have also seen that the nature of human rights has changed over the years. The nature of human rights today is more dynamic. It has become assertive as individuals have become cautious and put forward the right. At the same time, the state has also stretched beyond the mundane and has incorporated the emergence into the discourse of human rights. But there is yet a long way to interlink the state policies with human rights. For more detail on the topics, please refer to e-text of this lecture and the extended reading list provided with it. Also do attempt the questions given in the end. Thank you.